Hello and welcome to another Lewisburg Community TV video. Welcome Teacher Julia. A bookshop like no other. We're coming to you tonight from our schoolhouse near Lewisburg. Unfortunately, with the COVID crisis, we've had to close the shop completely. However, there's still stuff happening and we are reading a lot of books. At the moment, I'm reading four books. The first one, when all is said from Anne Griffin, that she read for us last week. So yeah, I'm part way through that. That's a really fantastic book. The Butchers, Ruth Gilligan, who we're also going to hear from as part of the Facebook Live. This book came out, well, last week, Friday, I think. And this week, actually. This week, yeah. Okay. And it's going to be a, it's going to be a bestseller, I'm sure. It's her fifth novel. Rachel English, also her fifth novel. We're hoping we'll have Rachel reading from the paper bracelet next week. And we have The Ape Life, which is a bit of a monster. It's 933 pages or so. It is translated from Georgian and it's the Chester Beatty book club read, The Ape Life. It is fascinating and I'm sort of part way through that one. And Neil, what, what have you got this week? Well, I've just finished Dan Jones' Crusaders, about the uh, the Crusades, obviously in the Middle Ages. And I met Dan last year at the Dublin History Festival. And that is a must for anybody who's interested in uh, medieval history. And also I've just finished Kremlin Winter by Robert Service, who once again was at the Dublin History Festival. And this is fantastic. And it's all about the corruption in the uh, Russian government. Brilliant books. So what else has been happening this week? We also have been selected to participate in, I'm looking at the name, the Spotlit Literary Product Incubation Programme, along with four other awardees on the northwest of Ireland. This is a project, Spotlit by EU, to promote literary tourism and literature and philosophy in the west coast of Ireland. We're also going to be working with Northern Ireland, Scotland, Iceland and Finland. Finland. And one of so this is exciting. We've been working on this behind the scenes. So there's a lot of stuff we're going to be going to be launching, and that's keeping us busy, which is which is good. And one aspect of this program is our up close and personal up close and personal with our favourite authors. So last week we had some authors. This week we've got Marion Kilcoyne, who is going to read from her latest poetry collection, which is just coming out this year. Marion from. Kiladoon. We've also got Shane Hegarty reading from his boot series, children's series, and telling us a bit about his inspiration and, and an excerpt from his books. I'm not forgetting Ruth Gilligan from The Butcher. The Butcher's book is going to be reading from her book as part of the, the live Facebook page. So I think we're going to go over to Marion. I'm Marion Kilcoyne and Neil and Breed from Tertulia Bookshop in Westport have asked me to share some of my work with you on Tertulia TV, which I am happy to do. So I'm going to read some, a couple of poems from my forthcoming collection called The Heart Uncut. Uh, it is to be published this year by Words on the Street, Galway. So these poems are largely nature-based. And the first one is called Penalty. Today the grass does not move in a whipping tangle or shiver like desire in slender unison this way and that, or even just one way, showing the endless bend that is love. Today, the juicy blades are stilled, leaving time to look up close, closer. Like the hummingbird to the agave, you have long been drawn to the green. The lush depth the joyous, just once, only that once, you looked too long and vanished. This second poem is called Liebslied, which is love song taken from the German. And it is really about this beautiful place that I am very privileged to be from, called Kiladun. And it was written on a, one of those perfect days in this place where sometimes you just have to down tools, sit back and watch the show. Leap sleet. Marsh brown thieves clutch bob cotton in fairy clusters while the heron lands. It's harsh cark a battle cry, shaving peace from a hazy afternoon. 
In a moment, you are born over and over again to this Atlantic refuge with its teeming silver hues. Safe place and padlock. Close the eyes now. Sounds of breaking waves on the shore. The smell of it. The bearable umami taste of it on lips forming words. The commotion. I hope you enjoy those two poems and I hope to share some more with you in the future. Thank you for your attention. And thanks to Neil indeed. Thanks, Marion. That was fantastic and uh, we're looking forward to hearing more from you soon. And this week, I thought we'd share a, a reading. It was in the Weekend Review. All of the Irish writers, which we're now becoming familiar with, Sinead Gleeson, John Boyne, you know, Kevin Barry, Peter Murphy, Patricia Scanlon, they all wrote about their perspectives on COVID-19. One I really liked a lot, so I'm going to read that, it's Kevin Barry. We've actually read his one of his short stories, Beer Trip, Beer Trip to Glandudno, as part of our Writers Book Club that we have. We meet about every two to three weeks in the bookshop. And Glandudno has actually become famous for the goats. the goats, yes, the goats running around wild in the town. So um, it's a great short story and we have his collection in the bookshop. And more recently I read Nightfall to Tangier on a trip to Dublin, reading on the train there and back and at my mum's. And yeah, it's, 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 he's a fascinating writer and I feel like this, this bit piece that he writes actually takes you into the head of Kevin Barry and I might get you interested in reading him if you haven't read him already. So his piece he called is We're All Having the Wombles. I was sitting on a beach at the smokers section outside Madrid airport last week, just taking a break from the face mask, but seriously thinking about going back on the fags when two Spanish soldiers passed by and at gunpoint encouraged us all to maintain our social distancing. I just got into the terminal to get a cafe con leche from a vending machine and I felt like I was first over the top of Flanders fields Wartime metaphors abound unavoidably. On the way back with my coffee, I was thinking that the dude who'd filled the vending machine was probably riddled with the virus, not a wordy thought if you're aspiring to be an officer material. Back in County Sligo, a pal phoned to say she was having a shocking dose of the wombles over Corona. She's not alone. We're all having the wombles over Corona. The mood changes at a whip crack. The darkness comes in vicious waves. You'll be rattling along calm enough, thinking about Netflix and making soup, when all at once you're blindsided by a stab of awareness, by an urgent reminder of the actual, such as the fact that they cannot bury their dead in Italy. My daily routine. I wake from an uneasy sleep. I shuffle to the shed and try to write. I'm distracted by mystery symptoms. I read portents into birdsong and changes of the wind. I avoid as much as possible the internet, the amplifier of morbid obsessions. I have freak outs, little panics, and then moments of hilarity. The spring sunshine is blissful, and I think a lot about death. Not a lot of the above falls into the category of business as usual. At the best of times, the nerves do be at me, and if you ever see, the, see me mooching along the road looking a bit distracted, you can presume that I am actually thinking about death. It's a topic I really put in the airs with, and Corona has in some ways not greatly altered the texture of my days. When we're at home in County Sligo, we don't see people much and self-isolation merely continues the usual mode. The Curly Mountains do not seem in any way perturbed. Loch Arrow remains serene and the hills are the same old hills. But the shadow deepens at the edges of the scene. I hope we come out of it all wiser. I hope we realise at least that we have been living in a fable. A fable of progress, growth and equality. But it's a very poorly told one, a very flimsy construction. I hope the veils at last fall away. Well, that's a little bit of the inside of Kevin Barry's brain, I think. So next up, we've got something a bit lighter. <laughs> and now we'll uh, hand you over to Ruth, uh, who's going to be reading from her book, The Butchers. Hello there. My name is Ruth Gilligan, and I am a novelist from Dublin, now based over here in the UK. This is my London flat, slash my London, you know, flat, office, gym, restaurant, just all the things under one roof at the moment, same as same as the rest of us. Um, so yes, here it is. Um, but I am, you know, greeting you from it uh, to talk a little bit about my brand new novel, The Butchers, uh, which came out just on Thursday. What a great time to release a book, wouldn't you say? 
yeah, not not tremendous timing. But anyway, this is the book, um, and it is now out in the world. And as it happens, tonight was supposed to be the uh, the launch party, um, in in Dublin. So it's gonna go to you know a bookshop, crowded bookshop on Grafton Street, with friends and family. You go to the pub afterwards. So needless to say, um, that that's not happening. But instead, I'm very happy uh, to be talking to you guys. And a huge thank you to uh, Lewisburg Community TV and Tertulia Bookshop for having me and extending the invitation. I was very honoured. Um, so yes, it's nice to be here chatting away to you. Um, before we go any further, I should just point out that this slightly strange pile of um, cow balloons um, were sent over by my mother um, in an effort to kind of mark the publication and the launch and you know despite the fact that obviously no parties are are going ahead anymore um still a bit of nonsense um to mark the occasion so they're now just taking up space in my office which is lovely although they look a bit sad and deflated don't they but anyway um they were they were lovely when they when they arrived um so as i said this is my novel the butchers um it is my fifth novel um and i keep describing it as a a feminist folkloric murder mystery. Um, which is quite a lot of things in one um, sentence, but there's quite a lot of things in this one book. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's a novel that takes place in the Irish borderlands, so predominantly Cavan and Monaghan, um, and it's set in 1996 during the BSE crisis. So hence the cows, and there's a lot of kind of cattle and bovine stuff in the novel you know it's set predominantly on farms um and amongst the farming community and yeah very concerned as I said with BSE and cattle and cows and beef um and yes as I said it's a murder mystery so it's set you know the focal point is is this murder um which the book kind of opens with um but then you know zooming out the book explores all these all these different themes and different characters and different families and different lives so there's kind of loads of different voices playing around but it all kind of coalesces around this one image of um of the dead body so before I go any further Sure, why don't I start by reading you um, the, the opening scene, the prologue of the novel, which kind of sets things up. So I'll, I'll, I'll read that to you and then I'll talk a little bit about, a bit more about, you know, where the idea came from, um, the research that I did along the way um, and some of the kind of backstory behind the butchers. So without further ado, um, this is the prologue. As I said, the novel is predominantly set in 1996 um, in the Irish borderlands, but as it happens, the prologue um, is set in 2018 in New York, of all places. Um, so it will soon become clear why. Even now, 22 years since he took the photograph, he still cannot quite believe the lack of blood. The cold store is in a big room, maybe 20 by 20 at a push. The wall tiles riddled with cracks and greenish buds of mould. Below, the floor is a dismal skim of concrete. Above, the bulb's glare is a merciless white. And in between, the metal brackets traverse the ceiling, the meat hooks laid empty in their rows. The lack of windows means it is impossible to tell whether it is night or day outside. It also means the walls are bare, save where a portrait of the Virgin Mary has inexplicably been nailed. And apart from our Blessed Mother, there is only one other person in that dilapidated room. There is a man hanging from the ceiling, upside down. The butcher is still fully clothed, minus his socks and boots. His overalls are fastened. His pale shirt is neatly tucked. Only the wounds confirm the worst, that he isn't just unconscious, isn't just sleeping the wrong way up like a bat. Only the holes in the bridge of his feet where the rusty hook has been pierced through, taking the weight of his body and holding it aloft. Leaving aside the wounds, there is something almost languid to the flow of the butcher's limbs. The flesh has been drained of any trace of violence, any trace of how he possibly found himself up there. And the eyes betray no pain as they stare out from beyond death towards the cold store doorway where they meet the blinding flash of the camera. Jesus Christ! Ronan steps back from the photograph and trips on a roll of bubble wrap by his feet. Usually, his apartment is pristine. Today, it is a chaos of boxes and gaffer tape. He glances at the clock on the wall. The delivery man will be arriving any minute. He is leaving this one unwrapped until the last possible moment. 
two decades on, there is still no denying the impact the butcher has on him. He has started to accept that maybe he will never produce a finer shot. That maybe, despite the awards and the international shows, his peak was right back at the very beginning when he was only a young Egypt wandering the Irish borderlands with a second-hand cannon and a baggie full of pills, a determination to find the perfect image that would get his career off the ground at last. So he supposes it is ego, more than anything, that has finally persuaded him to put this photo on public display. It is good, very good deserves to be seen. In the past, he always concluded reluctantly that showing it just wasn't worth the hassle. There'd been rumours around the body, suspicious circumstances and all that, which meant the image would have been treated more like a piece of evidence than a piece of art. But by now, the dust has long settled. No one even mentions it anymore, the ancient group they called the Butchers. Especially not over here in some small museum on the outskirts of Manhattan, where every curator looks about half his age and every photograph is accompanied by a brief wall text that reduces the image to its biographical minimum. The Butchers by Ronan Monks, County Monaghan, 1996. The man in the photograph is thought to have belonged to a group of ritual cattle slaughterers known as the Butchers. Composed of eight men, the group travelled the length and breadth of Ireland practising their folkloric customs. However, around the time of the photograph, the butchers disbanded after hundreds of years of service. Today, very little record remains of their ancient, unorthodox traditions. The buzzer sounds and Ronald startles. He presses the button by the intercom, then hears the delivery men coming up the stairs, their hardy footsteps in easy drawl. It won't take them long to move the pictures. The museum is only a 20-minute drive across the river. Some of them will probably be half Irish, just like him. All of them will probably expect a tip. But for these final moments, the only man that matters is the one in the photograph. His shadow pooled black, his toenails curved white in ten tiny crescent moons. Roman slides to the metal chain and undoes the latch. This could be a mistake, he thinks could mean giving up a secret buried safe for 22 years. Jesus Christ. He turns the handle and the light comes blinding in. So that is the prologue of my novel, The Butchers. Um, and as you can hear there, you know, the novel centres around this photograph of, of a dead body. Um, and the novel is really going back in time to figure out who he is, how he found himself up there. And also, you know, it describes this, the, the group of the butchers themselves who, you know, as it explains, are kind of this, this traditional group, almost like a cult who kind of travel around Ireland, um, killing cattle according to a very specific set of customs. Um, and the idea is that, you know, these customs are really dying out in the, the way that many traditions um, do, but there still are a, kind of a handful of people who do believe so that the butchers travel around Ireland visiting those farms and killing their cattle according to these, these old ways. Um, and, you know, the butchers, that group, that tradition, that, as I said, almost like a cult or at least a, a very kind of superstition, um, is set up against, as I said, the really real factual um, events that happened in 1996 surrounding the BSE crisis and that whole period in Ireland and what was going on in terms of the disease spreading or being contained, uh, you know, when the British beef was banned across the world in, in March 1996, you know, that had implications for Ireland. It meant that Northern Irish beef was officially banned, but the Republic of Ireland beef was grand so guess what happened they started smuggling beef and then cattle over the border um, of course this is 1996 so it's like the tail end of the troubles but the Good Friday Agreement hasn't yet been signed so it's a oh there goes my light it's a very interesting point in Irish history um, and yes you've got these kind of traditions and folkloric customs rubbing up against you know these real life events and, and that's what I was really interested in the book this this tension almost between tradition and modernity the old ways and the future um, and for me 1996 symbolizes that really as a as a hinge moment in Irish history you know on the one hand you know the divorce legislation has just been brought in um, it's only three years since homosexuality was decriminalized so you know in many ways Ireland is still kind of 
playing catch up in terms of becoming kind of a modern country. Um, the flip side is, you know, as I said, the Troubles is coming to an end. You've got the first kind of inclinations of the Celtic tiger, like the economy is starting to, to grow and grow. You've got the millennium on the horizon. So as I said, it does to me seem like this really interesting point between old fashioned Ireland and, and modern future Ireland. Um, so that tension, as I said, between tradition and modernity is really at the heart of the book. And that's why I've used kind of real life factual events alongside these kind of more mythical uh, folkloric ideas um, and bringing those two things together. Um, so, yes, in doing all of that, um, I had to figure out, well, who are my characters going to be? Who are the people that are going to tell this story? Um, and I'm, I've am i always been a huge fan of books that have multiple points of view. Um, so those are the books I write, despite the fact that they're really difficult. So it takes quite a lot of kind of architecture to figure out the different characters, the different points of view, the different storylines that kind of weave together and then and then coalesce. Um, so yes, lots of post-its on the wall um, to try and move stuff around and figure stuff out. But eventually what I hit on um, is there are four main voices um, and they are a mother and a daughter and a father and a son. And again, having those two pairs really allowed me to explore this idea of different generations, the old ways and the new ways, the tension between progress and tradition. Um, so yeah, and, and you know, generational clashes, what's passed down from one generation to the next, gen generational trauma, like all these things. Um, as I said, the, the mother, daughter, father, son, pairing um, allowed me to explore all of that. Um, I was also very interested, especially with the kind of mother-daughter pair, you know, I felt like a lot of novels that I was reading um, when researching my own, you know, Ireland has such a great history and a great canon of kind of novels set on farms basically and novels set in the border counties and and this kind of rural canon that we have, but a lot of the time they are male voices, you know, I'm thinking of kind of um, you know, Patrick Kavanagh, um, John McGahern, um, all these kind of great, great Irish writers, you know, very male and their characters tend to be quite male. And, you know, I was really interested in exploring well, what about the female voices in those situations and what are they, what are they doing and how do they fit into this portrait that we have of rural Ireland and especially at this, this hinge moment, um, what are they doing? So I was really keen, rather than focusing on the butchers themselves, who are a group of eight men, I was also interested in, in the women, the women that they leave behind when they go off on their travels. Um, so I'm going to read, the next bit I'm going to read is from um, a character called Una. So she's the, the daughter character in that pair that I mentioned. Um, and Una is the daughter of one of the butchers. Um, so the scene I'm going to read is when her father is just setting out on his travels. He spends 11 months of the year traveling around, enacting these traditional cattle slaughter, um, while Una and her mother are left behind. So this little extract is the morning that her father sets off and Una bidding him farewell. The dawn was barely cracked when the time came for departure. Her father would walk to a crossroads about a mile down the road where the others would be waiting with the horses and carts. Sometimes her mother, for a mess, suggested the butchers should drive, should invest in a minivan. Well, they say Ireland's getting more modern by the day. Why not keep up with the times? Una knew better than to laugh at that joke. Nothing about the old ritual was allowed to change. Her mother hovered next to her now on the front step, the pair of them sheathed in their dressing gown furs. The air outside was well below freezing, making white of their goodbye breaths. You're a gorgeous girl, her father croaked as he leaned down for a kiss. It took all her strength not to beg him to stay. The butcher embraced his wife one last time and ambled slowly out the gate. He looked so giant as he moved, big enough to be a myth himself. The fields around were raw with silence, the hillside stony pocked and sparse. It was a wonder anything would ever grow again. And Una was so distracted, she almost forgot. Love, her shoe. But as soon as her mother spoke, 
She took her slipper from her foot and flung it hard, watched it arc through the air, then land in the shimmering frost. It was another custom, meant to wish him luck on his travels. Her father didn't turn when he removed his hand from the pocket of his overalls and raised it high in acknowledgement. Una stayed out on the doorstep, watching, her left foot slowly going numb, until she saw the man shape blacken, then shrink, then disappear. Eventually, her white breath faded too, as the moon bowed out and the sun arrived, hurling itself cold and radiant into the morning sky. So that's just a little taster of Una's voice. Uh, as I said, she's one of the four points of view that make up the butchers. And it's really interesting, you know, that bit that I read and that, that you know, thing that Una does of throwing her shoe after her father um, to wish him luck on his travels, that was actually, or that is, or that was, um, a, a real life tradition, a real life custom. And, you know, people always ask me where the group, the butchers themselves, where they came from. Because, um, you know, technically they are an invention, um, but actually what they are is kind of a conglomerate of all different little bits um, of folklore and tradition mostly related to cattle that I found over the course of my research. So I was reading these books of ancient Irish superstitions and, and habits and customs. Um, and I just cherry picked from here and there and brought them all together. Um, and, and that's how I came up with the idea of the butchers. Um, it was very funny. My editor, um, who's British, um, he, for a very, very long time, thought the butchers were real and that you know he had no idea that this was a fabrication of mine so I remember quite late in the editorial process he, you know we were trying to figure something out that we couldn't quite untangle and I said well we could just change the butchers you know this aspect of the butchers and he was like well well no we can't do that because they didn't really do that and I was like James you do know that I have made the butchers up and he was completely baffled he had no idea so I mean again you know it helps that he's British so he probably just assumed that it was an Irish thing that he'd never heard of but of course it was true um but as I said it is it is a kind of a conglomerate of all these little bits and it, I find it really funny talking about is it true or made up because it raises issues of well our traditions customs superstitions you know define real you know it's really hard to know what is what is true and what is fabricated so I'm kind of interested in exploring that as well in the novel and you see the ways that people talk about the butchers and various rumors around them how they have kind of contributed to the myth and the legend almost as well so you see over the course of the novel um different people's accounts or ideas or or as I said rumors um coming together to kind of shape how they are viewed and, and how they are welcomed or, or or not, as the case may be. So they are just some brief thoughts about The Butchers, my novel, um, and a little bit of a taster. Um, obviously, at this point, I would urge you all to go out and buy it and read it. Um, but obviously, getting one's hands on books in Ireland at the moment is quite tricky. Um, for those of you who are Kindle readers or who are audiobook readers, you know, the ebook and the audiobook are available online. And um, this is actually the first time that I've had an audiobook deal, so that's quite fun. Um, I never knew how it worked, but they actually send you like almost a little menu of voices. So they sent me three samples of, of actors reading the book and I got to I got to choose which I liked. So I didn't know that that was that was how the process worked, so that was lovely. Um, so yes, if you are, as I said, a, an owner of a, a Kindle or if you like audiobooks, those are still available. In the meantime, I would ask you to sit tight and then when all this is over, at least when things, you know, the restrictions are lifted even slightly, um, I would love if you reached out to your, your local bookshop, preferably Tertulia, um, and, and ordered a copy of The Butchers because, you know, it feels like a timely book. Um, it's a book, as I said, that, you know, I spent many years working on and I only hope that despite everything that's going on, it finds its readers. That's all I can really hope for. Um, so thank you for listening and I hope you're all looking after yourselves and looking after each other. Um, and yes, be safe. Take care. Thanks everyone for tonight. Thanks to Ruth, thanks to Shane and to Marion. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>